Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Lee Porter? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Lee Chally Porter was born on December 28, 1994, and was raised in Redondo Beach, California. When she was four years old, her parents divorced, and she lived with her mother, Renee, and her brother, Max. Lee's mother remarried to a man named Michael. In 2006, her family moved to Cotopaxi, Colorado. This town, with a population of 44, is three hours south of Denver. Life there was slow-paced. There was not a lot to do. The town had one store, which also served as the only restaurant and the only gas station. In May 2013, Lee graduated from high school and attended a community college called Trinidad State College. She studied to be a massage therapist. Her brother Max studied at the same college, but he eventually returned to California. Lee ended up dropping out of college and living in Pueblo, Colorado, which is an hour and a half east of Cotopaxi. She found a 38-year-old boyfriend named Jesse McSorley, who was a substance user. Lee started using substances as well, including heroin. The relationship between the large age gap lovers was tumultuous. Eventually, Jesse decided to move to the state of Maryland to get clean from substances. Not long after midnight on June 3, 2014, Lee and Jesse checked into a hotel just outside Denver, Colorado. In the morning, the couple went their separate ways. Lee was not happy about this. She believed that Jesse would be her lover forever. Jesse would later suggest that he intended on returning to Colorado and marrying Lee if she received mental health treatment to discontinue her substance use. Now homeless, Lee decided to stay with a 23-year-old man named Christopher Adam Wade at his apartment in Westminster, which is just north of Denver. Christopher went by the name Chris, he had met Lee when they were high school classmates. The two were not really friends, just acquaintances. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On June 5, 2014, Lee Porter was reported missing. The last known person to have contact with her was Chris Wade. Here is what the police found during the course of their investigation. On June 3, 2014, two days before Lee was reported missing, she stopped using her cell phone and stopped accessing her social media. There was no activity on her financial accounts, and her vehicle was found parked at Christopher's apartment building. None of her belongings were inside her vehicle. On June 10, 2014, the police interviewed Chris Wade. Here is the story he provided to them. On June 3, Lee texted him and asked him if he wanted to hang out. She indicated that she did not want to be alone, and she was depressed. At about 1 p.m., they visited a Boston market for lunch. After this, they went to his two-bedroom apartment, where they played video games and engaged in consensual sex. Chris was into tarot card reading. He performed a reading for Lee. She interpreted the results as indicating that she should start a new life. Early on June 4, Lee received a message on her phone and left the apartment. She climbed into a white or light-colored pickup truck and this was the last time Chris saw her. He did not know the identity of the driver. When pressed by the police, Chris admitted that he disposed of his sheets and Lee's phone. At this point in the interview, Chris asked for a lawyer. The interview was terminated by the police, and Chris left. Investigators had plenty of evidence against Chris. They were pretty confident he was guilty of murdering Lee. On June 12, 2014, before the investigation could progress far enough to make an arrest, an unusual event took place, which sped up the process. Lee's brother, Max, her former lover, Jesse, and a friend of Lee's named Angela met with Chris with the hope of eliciting a confession. They had put together a ruse, which involved Chris performing a tarot card reading in a gazebo at a park. Max recorded the conversation with his cell phone. During the reading, Chris indicated that death was coming up, which of course was bad news for Lee. Max confronted Chris 
and ask where Lee was. Eventually, Chris confessed that he had killed her. The police were notified, Chris was arrested, and he repeated his confession. Here is the story he provided. When Lee was at his apartment on June 3, 2014, they were playing a video game. Lee paused the video game and kissed Chris. It was clear that Lee was excited. Chris stopped her several times, making sure that she was looking for sex. Lee insisted that she wanted to have sex with him. After they had sex, they engaged in an argument because Lee demanded that Chris purchase drugs for her. She told Chris that she intended on falsely accusing him of conducting an assault of a sexual nature if he did not. At this point, Lee retrieved a knife and lunged at Chris. He managed to dodge this attack. When she lunged at him again, he grabbed her hand and turned her around. In an effort to defend himself, Chris strangled Lee. He did not think that she would die, but that is what happened. He cleaned up his apartment, put Lee's body in a duffel bag, and disposed of it in a dumpster. Chris also disposed of Lee's purse, wallet, and clothing in various dumpsters. Chris Wade was charged with first-degree murder. He was offered a plea deal. If he helped the authorities find Lee's body, he could plead guilty to second-degree murder. A landfill in Commerce City, Colorado, was searched extensively by the authorities. They found a pillowcase containing Lee's wallet, identification, clothing, and cell phone, but they never found Lee's body. The prosecutor indicated that the plea bargain was still valid because the state could not prove that Chris lied. Investigators did fail to find Lee's body, but that does not necessarily mean Chris was lying. On September 25, 2015, Chris pleaded guilty to second-degree murder in accordance with the plea agreement. He also pleaded guilty to a charge related to possessing inappropriate images which were found on his computer. On November 6, 2015, Chris was sentenced to 48 years in prison. He will be eligible for parole after just over 33 and a half years when he is in his mid-50s. In 2022, eight years after the murder, Chris Wade sent a letter to the court describing what he did to Lee Porter. When Lee was in his apartment on June 3, 2014, she used the bathroom. When she exited, Chris was overcome by feelings of aggression and killed her. He had lied about the tarot card reading, lied about Lee demanding drugs, and lied about her attacking him with a knife. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Chris performed well in school, but he struggled to form meaningful relationships. People said that he did not fit in. Chris appeared to agree, saying that he was probably one of the weirdest guys most people would know. He always had difficulty relating to women. For example, Chris had trouble talking to them, or he thought that they were flirting with him. He did not appreciate how repulsive he was. Chris greatly overestimated his attractiveness. At one point, he told a relative about how he wanted to kidnap, assault, and murder a girl who lived in a trailer nearby. He even went to her trailer at night, but became frightened by a dog and did not follow through with his homicidal plan. Chris enlisted in the Army, where he served as a helicopter mechanic. It didn't take long for him to run into difficulties based on his mental health symptoms. After experiencing nightmares, he was evaluated by mental health clinicians. Chris was diagnosed with adjustment disorder with anxiety and depressed mood, a single episode of major depression, sexual sadism, and borderline personality disorder. He had revealed to clinicians that he wanted to conduct an assault against a woman with whom he was acquainted. Chris was given a medical discharge from the Army. After this, he went to college where he studied criminal justice. During the investigation into Lee's disappearance, the police searched Chris's apartment. They found thousands of images of women suffering from a clothing deficit. A few of the images featured individuals who were too young. As I mentioned, Chris pleaded guilty to an offense related to this. The police also found evidence that Chris was involved in bizarre email conversations with women from various countries. Evidently, he paid them, or promised to pay them, for clothing-challenged images and to act like he was in control of their every move. He demanded that the women call him sir or master. Item number two, some people believe that Chris lied about the location of Lee's body. 
like he never placed her body in the dumpster. How is it that the authorities found Lee's belongings in the landfill, but did not find her body? Perhaps her body was never there. It's certainly possible that Chris is lying. He was certainly deceptive about many other things. But he really didn't have any reason to lie after securing his plea bargain. It's not like he was holding on to his self-defense story, and he worried that the condition of Lee's body would contradict this narrative. He was going to plead guilty to second-degree murder, which is what he ultimately did. Item number three, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Christopher Wade was self-centered, impulsive, irresponsible, excitement-seeking, sadistic, immature, repulsive, cold, callous, socially awkward, manipulative, grandiose, depressed, anxious, lonely, aggressive, violent, had a sense of entitlement, and was exceedingly creepy. He had an intense interest in sex, but was unable to achieve romantic success due to his personality traits. Chris routinely entertained fantasies about committing assaults of a sexual nature and desperately wanted these fantasies to become reality. He was just looking for an opportunity that would feature a relatively low risk of getting caught. When he was in high school, Chris developed a sexual interest in his classmate, Lee Porter. She was aware of him, but they were not friends. Even so, after graduating, Chris stayed in touch with Lee through social media. Lee had a serious substance use problem, one which dominated her life. She was unwilling or unable to discontinue her substance use. When she separated from her boyfriend, Jesse, and became homeless, Lee planned on moving to the Denver area. Chris was aware of this because he monitored her social media posts. He even offered her assistance, like he was willing to help her stay off drugs. Lee came to think of Chris as an ally in her losing battle against substance use. On June 3, 2014, Lee contacted Chris so they could hang out. She made it clear that she was not interested in any type of romantic encounter or romantic relationship. This preemptive rejection is probably something Chris was accustomed to based on his high level of repulsiveness. Chris indicated that he was interested in romance with Lee, but said he understood and respected her position. Lee drove to Chris's apartment building and entered his unit. To say the apartment was disgusting is a massive understatement. It's like the apartment was impersonating a dumpster, except more objectionable. Trash, rotting food, and debris were scattered all over the apartment. Using a broom or a mop would have been insufficient to clean this place. It needed something like a front loader or a bulldozer. Despite being struck by the unbearable stench of the apartment, Lee decided to stay there for a while. This is a testament to her high level of desperation. She was not only willing to be near Chris, but remain in that apartment. Believing that he had finally been given the opportunity he was waiting for, Chris made a romantic advance toward Lee. After she rejected him, as expected, he killed her. Chris purchased bleach and latex gloves the next day. This was probably the first time he had ever touched bleach or latex gloves, maybe even the first time he had ever had direct contact with a cleaning product. The particular combination of personality traits that Chris possessed, including antisocial and narcissistic traits, facilitated his homicidal behavior, but also made it difficult for him to cope with being a killer. He believed himself to be a good person and felt shame about what he had done. The murder part was easy for him. Living with himself after the murder was not. Chris wanted some way to admit what he had done without accepting the consequences. This is why he developed the ridiculous self-defense story. Some killers have personality traits where they can get away with murder several times. Chris was not this efficient or stable. He may have been destined to kill, but could not escape responsibility even one time. In a sense, Lee Porter unwillingly sacrificed her life to save someone else. Those are my thoughts on the case of Lee Porter. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They consistently generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.